I expect that many people will have been delighted, as I was, by the recently announced news that W. H. Auden is to return shortly to England to live and work in Christchurch College, Oxford, where he was a student of English over 40 years ago. Today, Auden is 65, the age for many men of a well-deserved retirement. But in his case, I'm sure, and I certainly hope, no more than the springboard for a fresh bout of creative activity. The sheer quantity and variety of Auden's work have always been two of its most striking characteristics, and it would be impossible in any one radio programme to illustrate even a reasonable fraction of its range. Nevertheless, it seemed to us a good idea to celebrate Auden's birthday and to honour his achievement by inviting him to make his own selection from the total body of his work and to record a reading of it for us in New York, where he still lives in the winter. What he's done, as you'll hear in a moment, is to select from two kinds of poem. First, a group of short songs or lyrical pieces from all periods of his career, ranging back to the 1930s, and then a group of rather longer poems in the more conversational, unbuttoned style, which has come more and more to characterise his latest work. In this group, there are poems for friends and relatives, including one for his old tutor at Oxford, Neville Coghill, and one for his friend, the poet Louis McNeese. He ends the programme with a poem which hasn't yet appeared in a book, a lively performance piece, which many people have heard him read in recent years at the Poetry Book Society's annual festivals in the Queen Elizabeth Hall in London. Before we listen to Auden, I'm sure it's appropriate to wish him many happy returns, both of his birthday and, I think, too, of his muse. I begin with uh, a group of lyrics. The earliest one, I think, was written in 1930, uh, the last in 1955. Legend. Enter with him these legends, love, for him assume each diverse form to legend native as legend queer, that he may do what these require, be love like him to legend true. When he to ease his heart's disease must cross in sorrow corrosive seas as dolphin go, as cunning fox guides through the rocks, tell in his ear the common phrase required to please the guardians there. And when across the livid marsh big birds pursue, again be true. Between his thighs as pony rise, and swift as wind bear him away, till cries and they are left behind. But when at last these dangers past, his grown desire of legend tire, Oh, then, love, standing at legend's ending, claim your reward. Submit your neck to the ungrateful stroke of his reluctant sword. That, starting back, his eyes may look amazed on you, find what he wanted, is faithful too, but disenchanted. Love as love. Now the leaves are falling fast, Nurses' flowers will not last. Nurses to their graves are gone, but the prams go rolling on. Whispering neighbours left and right, daunt us from our true delight. Able hands are forced to freeze, derelict on lonely knees. Close behind us on our track, dead in hundreds cry alack. Arms raised stiffly to reprove in false attitudes of love. Scrawny through a plundered wood, trolls run scolding for their food. Owl and nightingale are dumb, and the angel will not come. Clear, unscalable ahead, rise the mountains of instead, from whose cold cascading streams none may drink except in dreams. Jumbled in one common box of their dark stupidity, Orchid, swan, and Caesar lie. Time that tires of everyone has corroded all the locks, thrown away the key for fun. In its cleft the torrent mocks. Prophets, when days gone by, made a profit on each cry, persona grata now with none. And a jackass language shocks poets who can only pun. 
Silence settles on the clocks. Nursing mothers point a sly index finger at a sky crimson in the setting sun. In the valley of the fox gleams the barrel of a gun. Once we could have made the docks. Now it is too late to fly. Once too often you and I did what we should not have done. Round the rampant, rugged rocks, rude and ragged rascals run. The next one has a title, The Fall of Rome. The piers are pummeled by the waves. In a lonely field, the rain lashes an abandoned train. Outlaws fill the mountain caves. Fantastic grow the evening gowns. Agents of the fisk pursue, absconding tax defaulters through the sewers of provincial towns. Private rites of magic send the temple prostitutes to sleep. All the literati keep an imaginary friend. Cerebrotonic Cato may extol the ancient disciplines, but the muscle-bound marines mutiny for food and pay. Caesar's double bed is warm. As an unimportant clerk writes, I do not like my work on a pink official form. Unendowed with wealth or pity, little birds with scarlet legs sitting on their speckled eggs, I each flew infected city. Altogether elsewhere, vast herds of reindeer move across miles and miles of golden moss, silently and very fast. Then this one is about the trials by fire and water of Tamina and Pamina in Mozart's opera, The Magic Flute. When rites and melodies begin to alter modes and times, and timid barflies boast aloud of uncommitted crimes, and leading families are proud to dine with their black sheep, what promises, what discipline, if any, will love keep? So roared fire on their right, but Tamino and Pamina walked past its rage, sighing O, oh, sighing O, oh, in timeless formatas of awe and delight. Innocent? Yes. Ignorant? No. Down the grim passage. When stinking chaos lifts the latch and grotta backward spins, and Helen's nose becomes a beak, and cats and dogs grow chins, and daisies claw and pebbles shriek, and form and colour part, what swarming hatreds then will hatch out of love's riven heart. So hissed water on their left, but Pamina and Tamino opposed its spite with his worship, with her sweetness. Oh, look now, see how they emerge from the cleft. Frightened? No. Happy? Yes. Out into sunlight. Then the last one of these lyrics is called A Walk After Dark. A cloudless night like this can set the spirit soaring. After a tiring day, the clockwork spectacle is impressive in a slightly boring 18th century way. It soothes adolescence a lot to meet so shameless a stare. The things I did could not be as shocking as they said, if that would still be there after the shocked were dead. Now I'm ready to die but already at the stage when one starts to resent the young. I'm glad those points in the sky may also be counted among the creatures of middle age. It's cosier thinking of night as more an old people's home than a shed for a faultless machine. But the red Precambrian light is gone like Imperial Rome or myself at 17. Yet however much we may like the stoic manner in which 
the classical authors wrote. Only the young or the rich have the nerve or the figure to strike the lacrimae rerum note. For the presence talks abroad like the past, and it's wronged again, whimper and are ignored, and the truth cannot be hid. Somebody chose their pain, what needn't have happened did. Occurring this very night by no established rule, some event may already have hurled its first little no at the right of the laws we accept to school, our post-diluvian world. But the stars burn on overhead, unconscious of final ends. As I walk home to bed, asking what judgment waits, my person, all my friends, and these United States. As this is a program for the BBC, I should like to read two occasional poems written for friends of mine in England. The first poem is called Epithalamium for Peter Mudford and Rita Orden, May the 15th, 1965. All folk tales mean by ending with a state marriage, feast and fireworks, we wish you, Peter and Rita, two idiosyncrasies who opt in this Hawthorne month to common your lives. A diffy undertaking, for to us whose dreams are odorless, what is real seems a bit smelly. Strong nerves are an advantage, an accurate wristwatch too, is a great help. May Venus, to whose caprice all blood must buxom, take such a shine to you both that by her gifting your palpable substances may reify those delights they are pervade for. Cool hymen from jealousies, territoid phantasms, sulks, competitive headaches, and pride's monologue that won't listen but the man's tautological echoes, ever refrain you. As genders, married or not, who share with all flesh a left-handed twist, your choice reminds us to thank Mrs. Nature for doing, our ugly looks are our own, the handsome bias. For we are better built to last than tigers, our skins don't leak like the ciliates, our ears can detect quarter tones, even our most myopic have good enough vision for courtship. And how uncanny it is, we are here to say so, that life should have got to us up through the city's destruction layers after surviving the inhuman Permian purges. Wherefore, as Mudfords, Ordens, Seth Smiths, Bonnergees, with civic spear and distaff, we hail a gangrel, Paleocene pseudo rat, the or papa of princes and crossing sweepers. As Adam's Eve's commanded to none such being, answer the one for whom all enantiomorphs are superposable, yet who numbers each particle by its proper name. And the second one, eulogy for Professor Neville Coghill on the occasion of his retirement in 1966. In our beginning was a snuffling life without sky or horizon, full of objects and not theirs, too close, over big, and not all of them friendly, lit up at moments from an invisible source by shafts of sunlight or split-second levin. Childhood remembered as a row of cloudless days, is a revision we make later on, after we've learned from noting the habits of stars, to annal births, bereavements, manage dimensions with standard weights and measures, derive our rages into useful leets, and know, without knowing when, we've made our bed. Whoever is waiting for us at ford or crossroads cannot be avoided now. And we must pray for a good death, whatever world we are destined to look on last. 
It could be a field of battle, or a vista of terse lawns and tantalized yews, or a forgotten province of sagging fences, weeds and peckerwood sawmills, where an ill-nourished, sullen people vegetate in some gloomy schism. But then was also an age of care. What nature was doing to us had to be coped with, the frown of crag or cupboard no more to be laughed away than a cruel fare, wife trouble, debts or public crises when the state trots out its higher clergy. Between though with luck for a Columbine season we are free to play. Swains of a pasture where neither love nor money nor clocks are cogent. A time to wear odd clothing, behave with panache and talk nonsense as I did ambling in Oxford's botanic meadows with friends. One austere dogma capped another, abstract noun echoed abstract noun, to voice our irreverent Amabian song. Blessed be Christchurch for having been so snooty forty years ago about E. Lit. What reason had I to suppose Exeter worth a visit? Now of the body I brashly came to my first tutorial in, not a molecule remains, but to its mind's eye, optically definite, is our meeting still. This Neville I knew was not the held and tenor of the lecture hall, not a disciple hunting Socratic bully, not a celibate glutton averse to pupils as to mal-edited texts, yet a don distinct as these from the common plump and as a privy counsellor more deserving of our vale and verge. Endowed with the charm of your Irish provenance, but no proper false, you countenanced all species, the alphas, the bone idol, the obstreperous, and the really rum. Never look cross or sleepy when our essays were more about us than Chaucer, and no unfinished shy production felt afraid to knock on your door. Among the aging, too large a group disappoint by looking a mess. And even Aphrodite's ex-darlings, who once swan through crowds the stare of all, turn lipless vipers or red-nosed turtorous bulls. But you have induced your structure of carbon rings and brine to assume a face that features a self serene yet haggard. A life lived droitly, with a license from now on for any conduct in mild Gloucestershire, whither our love shall follow. May sunbeams falling across your breakfast table forecast new agreeable hours to paint in, re thumb a pet author. Night by night, through your dreams, the sound of lapsing brooks assure you that you pass muster. I wrote a whole sequence of poems about what rooms in a house mean after I bought my house in Austria. And this poem is, first of all, it's about my study, and it's also an energy for my friend and colleague, Louis McNeese. It's called The Cave of Making. For this and for all enclosures like it, the archetype is valence thither. An anter, more private than a bedroom even, for neither lovers nor maids are welcome, but without a bedroom secret. From the Olivetti portable, the dictionaries, the very best money can buy, the heaps of paper, it is evident what must go on. Devoid of flowers and family photographs, all is subordinate here to a function, designed to discouraged daydreams. Hence windows averted from plausible videnda, but admitting a light one could mend a watch by, and to sharpen hearing. Reached by an outside staircase, domestic noises and odors, the vast background of natural life are shut off. Here silence is turned into objects. I wish, Louis, I could have shown it to you, while you were still in public, 
and the house and garden. Lover of women in Donegal, from your perspective you'd notice sights I overlook, and in turn take a scholar's interest in facts I could tell you. For instance, four miles to our east of the wood palisade, Carolingian Bavaria stopped. Beyond it, unknowable nomads. Friends we became by personal choice, but fate had already made us neighbours. For grammar we both inherited good mongrel barbarian English, which never completely succumbed to the Roman rhetoric or the Roman gravity, that nonsense which stood none. Though neither of our dads, like Horace's, wiped his nose on his forearm, neither was Porphyry born, and our ancestors probably were among those plentiful subjects it cost less money to murder. Born so, both of us became self-conscious at a moment when locomotives were named after knights in Mallory, science to schoolboys was known as stinks, and the manor still was politically numinous. Both watched with mixed feelings, the sack of silence, the church is empty, the cavalry go, the cosmic model become German, and any faith if we had it in imminent virtue died. More than ever, life out there is goodly, miraculous, lovable, but we shan't, not since Stalin and Hitler, trust ourselves ever again. We know that, subjectively, all is possible. To you, though, ever since last fall, you quietly slipped out of Granusian, our moist garden, into the country of unconcern. No possibility matters. I wish you hadn't caught that cold, but the dead we miss are easier to talk to. With those no longer tensed by problems, one cannot feel shy. And anyway, when playing cards or drinking or pulling faces are out of the question, what else is there to do but talk to the voices of conscience they have become? From now on, as a visitor who needn't be met at the station, your influence is welcome at any hour in my ubity, especially here where titles from poems to the burning perch offer proof positive of the maker you wear, with whom I once collaborated, once at a weird symposium exchanged winks as the juggins went on about alienation. Who would, for preference, be a bard in an oral culture, obliged a drunken feast to improvise a eulogy of some beefy, illiterate burner, giver of rings, or depend for bread on the moods of a baroque prince expected, like his dwarf, to amuse? After all, it's rather a privilege amid the affluent traffic, to serve this unpopular art which cannot be turned into background noise for study, or hung as a status trophy by rising executives, cannot be done like Venice or abridged like Tolstoy, but stubbornly still insists upon being read or ignored. A handful of clients at least can ruin. It's heartless to forget about the underdeveloped countries but a starving ear is as deaf as a suburban optimist's. To stomachs only the Hindu integers truthfully speak. Our forerunners might envy us, our remnant still able to listen. As Nietzsche said they would, the plebs have got steadily denser, the optimates quicker still on the uptake. Today even Talleyrand might seem a naive. He had so little to cope with. I should like to become, if possible, a minor Atlantic Goethe, with his passion for weather and stones, but without his silliness, read the cross. At times a bore, but why a knowing speech can at best, a shadow echoing the silent light, bear witness to the truth it is not. He wished it were, as the Francophile gaggle of pure songsters are too vain to. We are not musicians. The stink of poetry is unbecoming, and never to be dull shows a lack of taste. Even a limerick ought to be something a man of honour, awaiting death from cancer or a firing squad, 
could read without contempt. At that frontier, I wouldn't dare speak to anyone in either a prophet's bellow or a diplomat's whisper. Seeing you know our mystery from the inside, and therefore how much in our lonely dens we need the companionship of our good dead, to give us comfort on dowry days when the self is an nonentity dumped on a mound of nothing, to break the spell of our self-enchantment when lip-smacking imps of mork and hooey write with us what they will. You won't think me imposing if I asked you to stay at my elbow until cocktail time. Dear Shade, for your elegy, I should have been able to manage something more like you than this egocentric monologue, but accept it for friendship's sake. I'll end with something a little lighter. This is called Doggerel by a Senior Citizen. Our Earth in 1969 is not the planet I call mine, the world I mean that gives me strength to hold off chaos at arm's length. My Eden landscapes and their climes are constructs from Edwardian times, when bathrooms took up lots of space, and before eating, one said grace. The automobile, the aeroplane, are useful gadgets, but profane. The enginery of which I dream is moved by water or by steam. Reason requires that I approve the light bulb, which I cannot love. To me, more reverence commanding a fishtail burner on the landing. My family ghosts I fought and routed. Their values, though, I never doubted. I thought their Protestant work ethic both practical and sympathetic. When couples played or sang duets, it was immoral to have debts. I should continue till I die to pay in cash for what I buy. The Book of Common Prayer we knew was that of 1662, though with its sermons may be well, liturgical reforms are hell. Sex was, of course, it always is, the most enticing of mysteries. But newsstands did not yet supply Manichaean pornography. Then speech was mannerly, an art like learning not to belch or fart. I cannot settle which is worse, the anti-novel or free verse. Nor are those PhDs my kith who dig the symbol and the myth. I count myself a man of letters who writes or hopes to for his betters. Dare any call permissiveness an educational success? Say no those classrooms which I sat in compelled to study Greek and Latin. Though I suspect the term is crap, if there is a generation gap, who is to blame? Those, old or young, who will not learn their mother tongue. But love at least is not a state, either en vogue or out of date. And I have true friends I will allow to talk and eat with here and now. Me, alienated, bosh. It's just as a sworn citizen who must skirmish with it that I feel most at home with what is real. <laughs>